Hello to everyone. My name is Giovanni Morlino and I am a researcher at the National Institute for Astrophysics in Italy and working in Florence. So in this talk, I want to summarize some of the recent development in the field of particle acceleration supernova remnant shocks, underlining uh, some issues that we still are facing and trying to, to solve. Uh, when we talk about particle acceleration, what uh, we have in mind is the first order Fermi acceleration, where particles gain energy scattering uh, uh, close to a shock discontinuity and gaining energy uh, at each crossing. Now, the balance between energy gain and the escape probability from the region result into a featureless powerless spectrum. One of the reasons why this mechanism is important because this is uh, at the basic of the supernova remnant paradigm for the origin of cosmic rays, which is essentially based on these pillars here. Uh, there is an energetic argument, uh, um, the supernova remnant can supply, easily supply the cosmic ray energy density if 10-ish uh, percent of the explosion energy goes into cosmic rays. They have a spatial distribution compatible with the cosmic ray distribution as inferred from gamma ray observations. Uh, we know that there, is, mm, there are non-thermal emission uh, from a uh, single supernova remnant. And we also have a solid theory uh, which is applicable to supernova remnant shocks. Now, there are, uh, however, several uh, issues. The most important uh, uh, that still we need to understand uh, are these following. Uh, the maximum energy of particle uh, reached at those shock is still uh, um, uh, unknown. Uh, remember that we have to reach PV energy in order to explain the cosmic ray ob observed at the Earth. The predicted spectrum does not match the observed one, and I, I will comment on this. Uh, and finally, also the, uh, the final spectrum that supernova remnants are able to release inside the galaxy is something which is still um, com not, not completely uh, well known. The basic prediction of the linear version of this theory are essentially the following. The spectrum has to be a power law proportional to the momentum to minus four, which uh, translated for relativistic energy is energy to minus two. Acceleration efficiency is, is of the order of 10%. And the maximum energy is given by this equation here, which is obtained equating the acceleration time with the um, end of the ejecta dominated phase. You see, that uh, in this expression, the dependence uh, on uh, environmental parameters uh, like the mass of the ejecta, the explosion energy, and the density of the medium is pretty weak. So the maximum energy does not uh, depend strongly on those parameters. The most important dependence is on magnetic field uh, turbulence, this delta B over B0, because the dependence is quadratic. So in order to reach uh, PV energies, we need to strongly amplify the magnetic field. Uh, these predictions uh, became less clear in the nonlinear version of the theory, which means uh, that uh, it's the version that accounts for the cosmic wave feedback onto the shock dynamics. In this version, uh, predictions are very complicated just because it is nonlinear effect, and the, the, all the chain of processes determine simultaneously the acceleration efficiency, the spectral slope, the maximum energy, and the particle escape. Unfortunately, all those ingredients cannot be disentangled and have to be uh, solved uh, uh, altogether. And the key aspect of all this chain, uh, the most important uh, feature is the magnetic field amplification, which is the real uh, key of the process. It is interesting to notice, notice that uh, recently uh, a serious, uh, series of peak simulation, particle in cell simulation have shown uh, have confirmed uh, several predictions of the theory, like uh, the, the large efficiency, the spectrum, which is proportional to P to minus four, and the uh, existence of self-generated uh, turbulence uh, excited by the same cosmic rays. However, peak simulations can uh, are strongly uh, computational expensive, so they can actually only simulate uh, very few seconds uh, of the real world, and the maximum energy is limited to be of the order of one GB not larger. So we cannot really extrapolate all those results uh, to um, a situation where the maximum energy is much larger. Uh, when we compare the observations uh, with the prediction of the theory, uh, several uh, um, uh, surprises came out. Uh, in this plot, I'm showing gamma ray emission from several shell-type supernova remnants where the um, 
where the, the, the data are divided in three different uh, groups, uh, very young remnant in uh, green, Tycho and Kasei, uh, red uh, data showing uh, a young remnant with an age around 1000 years, and middle-aged supernova remnant in bluish uh, with an age uh, close to 10,000 years. You see that in no one of those cases, uh, the spectrum is flat like the one predicted uh, by the theory. They either are steeper or harder. Uh, in the case of other spectrum, we still don't know if uh, they originate from adronic or leptonic processes, namely either uh, PP scattering or inverse Compton in the case of electron uh, processes. And uh, for what concerns the maximum energy, uh, in all cases, so we have a maximum energy at most uh, close to 100 TV, but not larger, in general, much smaller. And especially in the case of middle aged supernova remnant, the maximum energy has to be between 1 and 10 TV. So it's not enough to explain uh, PV uh, particles. Uh, another important ingredient uh, inferred from observation is the magnetic field amplification. Uh, several young supernova remnants show very thin X-ray filaments, uh, which are uh, usually interpreted as due to uh, synchrotron emission of electrons that are losing energy in a very fast way because of the presence of a strong magnetic field. Uh, when you compare the, uh, this thickness, which uh, is of the order of a fraction of a parsec, with the typical length scale of um, due to synchrotron uh, losses, uh, you can infer the magnetic field, and the calculation gives a magnetic field of, or the, of the order of one, a few hundred uh, microgauss, according, depending on the, of the object. And as I was saying, these uh, uh, filaments have been observed in several uh, young uh, supernova remnant. Now, the next question to answer is where the magnetic field is indeed amplified, either downstream or upstream. It is important to stress that we need magnetic field amplification both upstream and downstream, otherwise particle uh, high energy cannot be reached, particle can uh, escape uh, from one of the two sides. But downstream is easy to amplify magnetic field because of several, several type of MHD instabilities. While uh, upstream there is only one way that are uh, instability is driven by the same cosmic rays because cosmic rays are the only agent able to travel ahead of the shock. From uh, uh, X-ray observation of 1006, uh, um, we have been able to uh, infer to um, uh, to provide a, a support for the existence of magnetic field amplification upstream because looking at the synchrotron emission, there is essentially no emission from the region upstream of the shock. Now, if the magnetic field were not amplified. Uh, electrons uh, uh, could travel much far away from the, uh, the shock, and this will produce uh, some emission ahead of the shock, which is not observed. So our interpretation is that magnetic field is indeed amplified, such that electrons are um, kept close to the shock, and they, they, they cannot emit um, far away from the shock. From the theoretical point of view, there are Three possible ways to amplify magnetic field due to cosmic ray instabilities, either the resonant streaming instability, the non-resonant and the turbulent amplification. Let me comment a little bit on uh, all these possibilities. The resonant streaming instability is due to uh, resonant interaction between particles and magnetic field waves, uh, Alvin waves typically, uh, with a uh, wavelength of the order of the Larmor radius of particle. They uh, grow very fastly but they saturate only at a level of turbulence uh, uh, not larger than B0, so delta B over B0 close to 1. Uh, so this means that maximum energy can be at most a few tenths of TV, so a factor at least 50 below the knee energy. The non-resonant bell instability is instead due to um, Lorentz force between the um, current uh, of, co of escaping cosmic rays uh, with uh, magnetic field uh, turbulence. In this case, uh, also the waves grow very fast, but at small wavelengths. So we need a sort of inverse cascade in order to uh, affect the diffusion coefficient for uh, the same particle that are triggering the, the instability. What is interesting in this case is that the maximum energy is proportional to the, uh, because it's proportional to the, the, the current, it is proportional to the square root of the density of the circumstellar medium. So in order to get high energy, as you can see from this expression here for the maximum energy, the only possibility is to strongly increase the density of the upstream medium. This can actually be done if we imagine a type 2 supernova, a core collapse supernova, which is exploding inside a dense 
the dense wind uh, of the projector. And indeed, this has been thought for several years um, as a, 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 the, the, a good possibility. But actually, in a recent work uh, by Pierre Christophe and collaborators, uh, they have applied the bell instability to several type of supernova, type 1a, uh, type 2, so normal cor collapse supernovae, and what they call type 2 stars, essentially um, core collapse supernova, but extremely powerful, a factor of 10 larger than regular supernova explosion, a, with a, a powerful wind and a very small uh, ejecta mass of the order of one solar mass. So in such a way, we have uh, at the same time a very fast shock and a very uh, dense medium in such a way that uh, PV energy and even larger energy can be reached. But those events are very rare. In the bottom, you can see uh, what is the final spectrum released by each one of these uh, uh, categories of supernova remnant. And you see that in case of type 1a, type 2, the maximum energy is reached uh, at most few TVs, while only in the case of type 2 supernovae, we can reach uh, uh, PV energies. Now, this poses a problem. In fact, if type 2 star supernova are the one responsible for the PV um, region of the uh, cosmic ray spectrum, they should uh, substantially contribute also at lower energies. So this means that uh, at lower energy, the contribution of regular type 2 and type 1a supernova should be not dominant, let's say. And this poses a problem for the, for the rule of these uh, objects, which on the other hand are the most common one. Uh, the last uh, um, ingredient, the last uh, instability, is the turbulent, so-called turbulent amplification, and is triggered by cosmic rays when the ambient medium has some inhomogeneities in such a way that the pressure exerted by cosmic rays produce a different force in uh, uh, dense and less dense medium, in such a way to produce a vorticity in the upstream medium, and the vorticity gives in turn rise to um, magnetic field amplification. The point for this instability is that in order to work, we already need a large precursor where the uh, instability has to, be, has to grow. And so this means that we already have to start with the maximum energy already, already large enough, and with a spectrum that has to be e to minus two in order to have enough power at the very end of the spectrum. Uh, so the, the, the rule of this instability is still uh, not completely understood, especially uh, if uh, uh, in, uh, it works uh, together with the other kind of instabilities. Uh, concerning the the, how um, we can modify the slope uh, compared to the regular e to minus two, which is predicted by linear theory, there are several possibilities. So concerning the spectrum harder than e to minus two, essentially we have only two possibility. Either uh, the emission is due to, lepton to inverse Compton, leptonic processes, or it is due to hadronic processes, but with a shock expanding into clumping media. I will uh, underline a little bit more this process. Concerning the hard spectra, we have two um, different categories of explanation. One applied to um, young remnant where the, the shock is quite uh, fast. So either we can modify the velocity of the magnetic turbulence, or we have to consider the energy loss during acceleration, uh, or um, we have to, in, in, to calculate, to account for the um, anisotropy of the distribution function. But this uh, is important only for very fast shock of the order of 10,000 kilometers per second. For a sh much lower shock speed, uh, uh, less than 3,000 kilometers per second, which is typical for middle-aged supernova remnant, the shock structure can be modified by the presence of neutral hydrogen giving rise to steeper spectra, or uh, uh, steeper spectra can also be explained by escaping particles. I will underline only these three processes. So concerning art uh, spectra obtained by shock expanding in clumpy media, what happens when a shock is propagating in those regions is that around a small and dense clump, the magnetic field is amplified because of the vorticity, and this can reach up to hundreds of microgauss. This implies that there is a sort of uh, shielding effect due to the magnetic field 
uh, that prevent the low energy particle to penetrate inside the clump. Now, in a real situation, if we assume that the, the amount of mass is mainly concentrated inside clumps, then uh, the gamma ray spectrum is dominated by particles that are able to penetrate inside those clumps. Uh, so this implies that the spectrum, even if uh, the particle spectrum is proportional to P2 minus four, the final gamma ray spectrum will be harder because low energy particles have some difficulties into penetrating the clump. And in fact, here you can see the gamma ray emission from a single clump uh, as soon as the shock is crossing the clump and after uh, is eating evolving time. And you see that after a while, after say several hundreds of years, the emission uh, becomes finally flat, uh, but at the beginning is very, uh, very hard. And if now we integrate over a, a population of uh, uniformly distributed clumps around the remnant, we end up with a spectrum which is flat enough, hard enough to uh, be able to explain the emission observed by, in this case, by supernova remnant at J1713. So this mechanism seems to work quite well. And remember also that uh, the existence of small dense clumps is not just a working hypothesis, but has been inferred from observation both in non-thermal X-rays, but also in molecular transition lines with ALMA. The other possibility to get uh, soft spectra is uh, modifying the velocity of scattering centers. Now, the slope of particle uh, depends on the compression ratio here, which, uh, uh, to be more precise, the compression ratio has to be has to include also the advance speed of the waves. Usually, uh, this advance speed is much lower than the shock speed, so can be neglected. But if the magnetic field is amplified, there is the possibility that this uh, speed is large enough. Com not comparable, but a fraction of the shock speed. In this case, uh, the final compression ratio will be modified. And we have essentially two different possibilities. Either the waves are upstream are, are doing the job. So essentially the waves are upstream are uh, running far away from the shock. And so the final compression ratio is smaller and the spectrum uh, is steeper. Or the same game is done by waves in the downstream. So also in this case, from the shock, the waves are moving far away uh, on the other side, are traveling far away, and uh, giving a final compression ratio, which is uh, smaller. We clearly also can have a combination of the two effects. It is quite interesting that in a recent paper by Damiano Caprioli and collaborators, they have been able to show, using hybrid simulation, that uh, the situation, the, the, uh, the, the picture that seems to work is the second one, the, um, the case B, scenario B. In this, they, they interpret the spectra that they, they observe, which is steeper than P2 minus four, due to waves that are traveling far away from the shock in, in the downstream. So this, to me, is a quite interesting result. The last uh, way to get soft spectra is uh, uh, accounting for energy losses during acceleration. Now, the slope is determined by a, a balance between the probability of escaping and the energy gain in each single uh, cycle. And they, in the linear treatment, they are both proportional to the shock velocity. And this is the alpha is the final spectrum in the energy, um, in the energy for the energy spectrum E2 minus alpha, where the R, uh, R is the compression factor. Now, if we consider that for each cycle, particles are able to, the particle lose energy because they amplify the magnetic field, the final energy gain per cycle is, uh, is reduced. Now, parameterizing these, uh, energy gain using a beta, a B factor that represent the energy loss uh, of particle in favor of magnetic field, the final spectrum will have this slope. And in order to explain what we observe, um, namely a spectrum proportional to energy to minus 2.3, this requires a fraction of energy loss uh, between 20 and 30%. That in turn implies a magnetic field uh, in the upstream of the order of few 100 microgauss. Now, this is a bit extreme, not incompatible with observation. So to some extent, this, this um, explanation can indeed be effective. So I think I can stop here. In this last slide, I summarize my conclusions. Essentially, there are two. From uh, 
the this physics shock acceleration uh, is still the most valid framework to explain the origin of cosmic rays, but some fundamental problems are remain unsolved. One is connected to the spectrum, uh, which is never observed, e2 minus 2, which is predicted by linear theory, is never observed. And I, I, I have uh, discussed the uh, possible way to uh, prevent uh, this, uh, to explain this modification. And the other, uh, um, the other thing is the maximum energy, which is always below 100 TV. It's difficult to reach a PV, even in the most extreme cases of um, powerful core collapse supernovae. In fact, in that case, even if we reach PV energies, uh, we are facing a problem because the, it seems that the rule of uh, most common supernova remnant uh, should be negligible. And the whole job should be done by those extreme powerful supernova remnant. I can stop here. Thank you very much. Goodbye.